Uh, good morning and welcome to the 18th meeting of 2018 of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. Uh, before We have apologies uh, from Alex Neal. Uh, Joan McAlpine is here as his substitute and we'll hear his declaration of relevant interests at a later meeting. So welcome, Joan McAlpine. Before we move to the first item on the agenda, I want to remind everyone present to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices as these may affect the broadcasting system. The first item on the agenda is for the committee to consider whether to take item eight in private and to reschedule item two for an alternative meeting date. Are we all agreed? We are agreed, thank you. So the third, uh, is, uh, well, what is now the second item on the agenda today is to hear evidence on the Environmental Authorisation Scotland Regulations 2018 draft uh, from Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham, good morning, and from Joyce Carr, Head of water, the Water Environmental Team at the Scottish Government. Cabinet Secretary, do you want to make an opening statement on this? Um, very briefly, I think it would be helpful, um, Convener. Um, effective environmental legislation uh, is obviously essential if we're going to continue to uh, protect Scotland's natural resources. And our legislation has to be efficient and risk-based to ensure any associated burdens on business are proportionate. Um, these regulations before you represent a significant step forward uh, in providing that more efficient, effective and risk-based protection of the environment. Um, the existing legislation for our key environmental regimes has evolved over a number of decades and as a result the current framework of environmental regulations has become more complex than it needs to be. The four main environmental regimes for water waste, pollution prevention and radioactive substances currently have different procedures and timeframes for granting authorization, carrying out monitoring and taking enforcement action for non-compliance. Now, many sites have multiple authorizations, multiple inspections by different inspectors, and different monitoring arrangements, and that's inefficient both for the regulator and for the operator. The new integrated framework of which these regulations are the first step will create a common set of procedures for these core regulatory components. And the majority of the components making up the new framework already exist in one or more of the existing four main regimes. For, for instance, the framework uses a similar tiered system of proportionate controls as that introduced in the Controlled Activities Regulations in 2005, and which is now accepted as an efficient and successful approach. So this provides a simple, transparent and integrated system that makes compliance easier and more straightforward for business. The framework also includes a broader fit and proper person test to strengthen SEPA's powers to ensure the right person holds the authorization. This will provide a level playing field for business, ensuring disreputable operators or criminals are unable to obtain or keep authorizations. And it will also ensure that people and communities are properly engaged in decision making, particularly those directly impacted by activities. In addition to the common set of procedures, certain technical provisions are required for each of the four main regimes, and these will be contained in technical schedules. We plan to implement the framework in tranches, starting with the provisions for radioactive substance activities, which are contained in the technical schedules to these draft regulations. The technical requirements for the water pollution prevention and waste activities will be added in subsequent tranches. So the committee has that to look forward to. I'm confident this integrated framework will provide an effective and efficient approach to the protection of our environment whilst minimising the burden for business, and I'd ask the committee to support the instrument. Okay, thank you, Councillor. It strikes me reading through the instrument that potentially, in practice, the fit and proper person test is a big improvement on what we've had up to now. Is that a fair assessment? Um, I think that that probably is. It's, uh, it's, um, uh, it was one of the things that we uh, were very keen to do, um, and the, the, uh, partly because we had indications of issues arising out of the, uh, out of the way it has been managed up until now. Um, it, it's basically going to streamline what are effectively different approaches in, in, in uh, uh, different regimes. Um, and that means that it's easier then across the whole entirety of this uh, to, to, uh, to see who uh, would be and who would not be uh, a fit and proper person. So basically, SEPA will have a duty to grant or transfer 
the authori an authorisation for a regulated activity only where it's satisfied that the proposed uh, person is a fit and proper person to carry on the activity. So, uh, and in, there are some ways in which this will make SIPA be able to be more proactive when it comes to waste, crime and repeat offenders. And I would have expected that would have been something that would be pretty much welcomed uh, uh, by the majority of people, perhaps not the waste, crime and repeat offenders themselves, of course, but then um, uh, that would, uh, uh, as you would anticipate, not be welcomed by them. At the moment, SEPA can only consider environmental offences, um, but the framework will allow a wider range of offences to be taken into account. So involvement in serious organised crime demonstrates a disregard for the law, and we believe people who show such disregard should generally not be considered fit and proper people to be carrying out certain activities. I mean, there will be other benefits and, and uh, uh, what have you, but uh, in the round, what this is, is, is framed to do is to create a better test and a test that works across all the regimes. Yeah, excellent. Right, I'll open this up to members. I've already got an indication from Stuart Stevens. I think Mark Ruskell wants to ask questions. Stuart Stevens. Uh, thank you. I just want to talk about the narrow issue of uh, dealing with radioactive substances in the offshore sector. Uh, in your helpful uh, letter to us, uh, uh, Cabinet Secretary, you refer to the preparation of a Section 104 order. And I have two questions related to that. First of all, um, who, who's been looking after this up till now? Um, and secondly, uh, will the, in the 104 order give ministers uh, the powers to change uh, the regulations? Or is it just one off to implement the particular regulations that are before us? I, I think Joyce wants to. Okay. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Um, the, in terms of what's currently happening, the minister, our ministers already have powers under the Radioactive Substances Act. The 104 order is merely to extend the new regulations to the offshore sector, as is currently the case. Um, it's simply that in terms of procedure, because the Radioactive Substances Act is being repealed, we need to go through that process to make sure these new regulations can apply to the offshore sector, as they do at present. So, so the net effect is, is nil. Correct. Thank you. Mark Roscoe. Thanks. Um, you mentioned, Cabinet Secretary, that one of the objectives of this regulation is to ensure that people are informed and engaged in decision-making. I'm just wondering how that will actually take effect on the ground. If I can just give you an example. Um, near Dunfermline is an open cast, former open-cast coal site called Muirdeen. Uh, where distillery waste was being pumped into the ground uh, over the weekend, causing an enormous stink. If you go a few miles up the road, you've got the Moss Moronethylene plant. And I think in both these cases, communities don't know who is responsible for regulating. There's confusion about whether it's Fife Council, <coughs> whether it's SEPA. Uh, they're confused about the process of regulation under the PPC regulations at the moment. So. How will this new integrated framework actually allow communities to engage much more in that, in that decision making? How will it look at the front end, at the community end? If you've got an environmental problem, uh, how will this benefit you? Oh, well, I mean, as part of the consultation, um, uh, community councils, for example, uh, were uh, involved. Um, uh, so they're at a, a very kind of basic community level, uh, the consultation was reaching into that into that area of uh, uh, of of activity, so uh, there ought to be a relatively widespread understanding that this is this is in process. Um, uh, now, I, I don't want to get drawn into attempting to discuss individual sets of circumstances. Um, uh, um, I, I don't think this would be the the, the right place to do that. Um, but I, I would have expected that there was a fairly widespread understanding of the role of SEPA, or the fact that SEPA is likely to have a role, um, uh, as well as, in some cases, depending on what the activity is, some local authorities. I'd be surprised if most, uh, most communities didn't regard SEPA slash local authorities as their first port of call uh, for when, uh, uh, when these things uh, go awry. Um, so, so community councils at that level, we've already been involved in the consultation, which should already be aware uh, that this consultation uh, has been taking place. 
um, and, uh, uh, and a widespread understanding uh, of, uh, uh, of what it means. But I, I think what's important here is, is understanding that what we've done is bring together uh, existing frameworks into a more coherent framework. So, you know, I guess I don't want to say nothing has changed, but I don't, I don't want to make it sound as if everything has changed either. Not everything has changed. What we're doing is streamlining a process, making it easier uh, for people when they touch base, whether that be the, the people who are regulated or those who have concerns, making that more straightforward. And I would expect that uh, once this is rolled out, it will become easier for people then to understand uh, because they're not dealing with a lot of different rules in different sets of regulations, which I suspect is what causes some of the confusion up until now. I, I think perhaps the confusion arises because you, you said about, you know, SEPA slash local authorities. There is a confusion about where the responsibilities of one organisation lies and where the responsibility of another organisation starts and stops. So in terms of the front end, I'm just struggling to understand. If, I, if I'm sitting there in a community and I've got an environmental problem, what, what, where do I go? Um, how does this actually change that process, regardless of the issue, and make it more streamlined for me as a, as a concerned citizen? Well, I, I, does it I, provide I, a new portal? Does it, I, I don't know, because at the moment it is just you know, one organisation slash another organisation. I don't know which one to go to. Well, um, I, I would imagine most people's first port of call would be SEPA. Um, uh, if it's something that's a local authority responsibility, um, I dare say SEPA will direct them to the local authority. Um, uh, uh, the local authority obviously has lots of responsibilities, uh, particularly because they are the planning uh, uh, authority. Um, they are also... Uh, um, the Environmental Health Authority, and unless you're proposing taking powers away from local authorities, and I'm assuming you're not, but you may be, then that will continue to be the case. There will continue to be situations in which both local authority and SEPA will continue to have a role. Um, we aren't. Th this is not about setting up some kind of one-stop shop somewhere. SEPA is actually most likely to be the first port of call for people with a concern, uh, and SEPA will know when the issue is raised, if that is something that is better directed towards a local authority than, uh, uh, than, sitting, uh, than sitting with them. But in most cases, SIPA do respond uh, uh, in one way or another. Um, and you know, while people may not always be uh, content with the outcome or the results of what SIPA does or doesn't do, um, uh, usually, I think SEPA will be the first protocol for the vast majority of people. John Scott. Thank you. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, just can I ask you to expand on the missing of the transposition deadlines a little, please? Uh, some of that, uh, I'm afraid, was situation beyond our control. Um, we've got, uh, if I can just find the actual detail of what's happened, that, because this is tied up with um, uh, changes south of the border as well. This is, th th these were, this was not, this was not entirely um, uh, our, uh, our, our doing. Um, I, I think we've written to the committee with some uh, elaboration. Um, the, the, there are various sets of UK regulations that cover a mix of reserved and devolved measures uh, which couldn't be straightforwardly accommodated in existing regulatory positions. Um, and that, the reference to section 104 order um, is, is an example uh, uh, of that. Um, so, you know, we've been caught with um, a, an issue which hasn't really come out of our own uh, making um, were advised by Bayes that the Commission is unlikely to do anything um, uh, in terms of infraction in regard to the UK uh, before the, and the year's anniversary of the transposition deadline. So Bayes are also conscious that this trying to align uh, the different jurisdictions has been, has been a problem. 
Um, uh, I don't know if there's further that Joyce can say, but I, I mean, I think basically that's, a, this is not about assigning blame, but we've been pretty much held to a time scale that wasn't entirely of our making. I see you uh, in your letter to the convener, you're talking about bringing forward a consultation. Um, would be a time scale for that? I presume that's a Scottish consultation, is it? I don't know. If you, you, are you aware of a time scale consultation? And it's on, apparently. Oh, right. um, as soon as it's reasonable, um, my, my colleagues who deal with radioactive substances have been actively working on that consultation. The uh, constraint will be the legal resource to develop the draft regulations. So that's what we're waiting for. And that constraint lies within the Scottish within government? Within the Scottish government. Yes, right. OK, thanks very much. Okay. <coughs> Claudia Beamish. Thank you, convener, and good morning, uh, Cabinet Secretary, and to your official. Uh, could I just look at the other end of the community um, engagement uh, with um, the role of the new... Uh, regulatory regime as it as it integrates and ask you if you could give us any reassurance about the feedback to communities on such significant issues as Moss Moran and um, issues such as um, the spreading of sewage sludge in my constituency at Glen Taggart for instance uh, just how does what is the process whereby communities know what decisions have been made well, SEPA is actually um, in the early stages of developing, uh, uh, of implementing a sector approach to uh, regulation and sector plans are going to be at the heart uh, of everything uh, they do. Um, that will, that's designed to try and develop a confidence in the system uh, um, so that people would, would have, you know, easy recourse to uh, uh, to those uh, sector plans. Um, th there is a 24-hour pollution hotline and a mobile phone app for members of the public. Now, you know, there may be a, a question over how many members of the public are actually aware of the hotline and the mobile phone app. Um, and I certainly will uh, ensure that the question is asked of SEPA to, to admit perhaps they need to up their, up their um, publicity activity uh, around that, and that, that's really for reporting any possible uh, pollution incidents. Um, and that should give reassurance to the public that when something does happen, that they have the ability to, to register that uh, is issue straight away. Um, communities obviously do have to be kept informed, responding to incidents as they emerge, um, and uh, uh, getting clarity around the role uh, and response. Um, and that's, in a sense, a constantly developing thing. So, um, uh, you know, I, I don't think you ever get to a point where that's a perfect, that's a perfect activity. Um, but uh, the 24-hour hotline and the mobile phone app, uh, certainly uh, I would hope that the public were aware of it, um, of those two things. And if they weren't, that they can be, uh, those things can be brought to people's attention. Um, and that allows people instant um, uh, access uh, to some of this. And I, it's hard to know just how you come, you know, once it's, once it's happening, that that instant access is important. Um, uh, and I mean, I'm aware SEPA is also at public meetings, um, will go out uh, uh, to areas and engage, particularly when there's perhaps an ongoing uh, situation. Um, and uh, uh, I expect that activity will continue. Um, the the, the authorisations framework isn't going to change that activity. I hope that it streamlines the message that is able to be gotten across and simplifies it, but it isn't going to change that activity. Sorry. Sorry. At the further end of that, Cabinet Secretary, say if we take the example of, um, uh, of Glen Taggart, just uh, as, I, as I know quite a lot about it, um, would there be, um, could there be a commitment by Scottish Government to 
put up any results and decisions um, on the CEPA website so that that could easily be accessed by the public. Is that something, perhaps that happens anyway, I don't know, but, or is that something that we could, going forward, you know, um, I think let people know? I think we can, we can uh, um, certainly raise that. Um, uh, th there is a provision for publicity notices is it not relevant in this no, one? No. CEPA do publish all decision making on their website. Yeah. Okay. So I I was kind of just reading here about publicity notice, which are matters for the for the courts, um, uh, because there is a there is a process by which publicity orders can be made. But that's perhaps you know a a, a big kind of bit of artillery that uh, is beyond where you're actually talking about just now. Um, I think it may be that people aren't engaging with with the what is available already on CEPA, which you know suggests to me that CEPA needs to perhaps be a bit more uh, proactive about what is already available. Um, if all their decisions are being published on their website, then the website itself becomes. I think I think the work that CEPA did around the flooding kind of activity uh, is possibly a case a, a case study for how good it can be in terms of uh, managing the publicity around issues so perhaps they need to think about extending that that particular way of dealing with things across a, a wider set of uh, regimes thank you uh, Alex Rowley I think the um, I know you don't want to talk about specifics cases, but I think I, I, I could say to you in all honesty that the confidence that people have on SEPA and Fife when you start to look at specifics, uh, there, is, there is a real problem there. Um, the, the Dunfermline example from Thursday through to till, till Sunday, where, where the smells were so horrendous that people were being physically sick, and the lack of communication, whether that's with SEPA or Fife Council, of what was was going on, but there are then there is then the Mossmore situation where a final final written warning has been given to Mossmore. Nobody understands what that final written warning really means. SEPA have not published in detail why they have issued that final written warning. You have the former naval base up at Lathamond where where it took a year and a half to get a conviction uh, to people for, for, for the, the mess they left here, and SEPA will now not clean it up, have not printed the detail of why. So, so every time that you come across cases involving SEPA, you end up thinking, do they have the powers to actually uh, act on behalf of communities? And, and time and time and again, communities are let do down. So, I do hope that we can see more joined up working, but I think you know there needs to be um, a, a number of questions answered around communities and their dealings with SEPA, where they have problems and SEPA just seem either powerless or, I, I don't know, unable to, to address issues. Um, well, you know, there's a, there's a whole load of issues wrapped up in that which aren't very easy for me to unpack in the context of this conversation this morning. I mean, not least of which is that ultimately, once something goes into the judicial system, SEPA then doesn't have control of the timescales of court proceedings. So if something takes a year or 18 months through the court, it, it's not actually SEPA then that's causing that delay. It's it's the normal court processes that, that, that will uh, slow things down and I appreciate that's frustrating for people but it is what it is um, and will apply to a lot more than SEPA. Um, so uh, I think we need to be clear about which aspects of what we're talking about are actually things that are in SEPA's control um, and, and which are not. Um, but, but that would then perhaps suggest to me that there are some people that think that the legislation upon which SEPA was sort of set up in the early years of this parliament is, is, is something that, that uh, they would like revisited. I'm not entirely sure that it's, it's, it's kind of something that I can answer just off the top of my head without looking at a lot of the detail of, of, of individual decision making uh, um, and, and understanding 
uh, why in some cases SEPA clearly believe they don't have powers and where they do. Um, you know, if, I could, if you could come back and ask, well, what is the right of the community to challenge SEPA? Um, so if you take the Lathamon case, where the, the conviction's now taking place, the, the mess is still there, SEPA won't clean up because it'll cost over a million pounds, and they say it's safe enough. Uh, the, judge, the judge was highly critical of SEPA in the case, but... Not familiar with this but case. What's, but what's, what's the right of the community to appeal uh, where SEPA take a decision not to clear something up, what rights does communities have? Well, we're, we're straying away from the instrument in front of us. However, Alec Rowley raises some interesting points. Could I ask you, Cabinet Secretary, to write to the committee on that point, right back to us, about the rights of the community, or the rights of the community in circumstances such as these, not necessarily that case, and also this point about what does a final written warning constitute? If you could write back to us right, separate okay. to today yeah, we can do that. and explain it. Is, it. is there any other points, Mr Rowley? Right. So we, if, perhaps separate to today, if you could write back to us on those gener generalities, that would be useful rather than the specific case that's, that's referred to. Do any other members have questions? No? Okay. In, in which case, we'll move to the fourth item on our agenda, which is consideration of the motion S5M12403, that the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee recommends that the Environmental Authorisation Scotland Regulations 2018 draft be approved. Um, Cabinet Secretary, do you want to speak to and, of course, move the motion? In your um, I don't think I need to say anything further, so I move that these regulations be approved. Thank you. Um, any members wishing to comment upon this? Mark Ruskell. Uh, thanks, convener. I'm, I'm quite happy to support this. I mean, it makes a lot of sense in terms of providing a more integrated framework and, you know, welcome the first tranche coming in around radioactive materials. Um, I think ahead of the next tranche coming in, particularly around pollution prevention and control regulations, um, I would like to see how this is actually going to work on the ground and whether we're going to see improvements, particularly for environmental reporting with communities. Um, situation I raised earlier on, Alex Rowley's raised it as well, in relation to the odour nuisance at Dunfermline. Uh, on Thursday night, there were nearly 2,000 shares of a post on Facebook. And if you read the threads, um, comments that are being made after this post, uh, there's just a continual debate about whose responsibility it is. Is it SEPA? Is it Fife Council? Uh, who's got responsibility for this? Does anybody actually know what's meant to be spread at this site compared to what actually has been spread? So I think there are major issues around information flow, obviously not entirely relevant to this regulation because it's more about the PPC regs that will come later. So when we get round to that second tranche, I'd be interested to know what improvements CEPA are going to make and how they're going to make that front end absolutely seamless for communities that need information, and they often need information quick as well. I just ask it. I think if um, very specific and very individual cases are going to be referred to, it would be really helpful if we could get an indication of what they might be. As you will appreciate, there are enormous differences just simply from case to case. Every one of them will probably turn on very specific sets of information. Um, and you know, if I'm to be helpful in these circumstances, um, it would help to have some of these things flagged up so that we can do uh, a little bit of work and understand and therefore be able perhaps to explain more clearly um, why a particular set of circumstances is what it is. I mean, I can answer generally in terms of, you know, generalities, like once something goes into the justice system, it is out with SEPA's control in terms of time scale. Um, but if there are very particular sets of circumstances, it's, it's uh, you know, otherwise we'll just be in a position where I have to then promise a letter again. Yeah, but, but you've also picked up on that point and you can perhaps respond to us in the course of the letter that you're going to write subsequently. Uh, Richard Lyle followed by Claudia Beamish. Sorry, uh, convener. For those of, those of us who are previously councillors, I would say that any uh, pollution, any smell is the responsibility of the environmental department of the local council rather because they're on the ground. SEPA is, can then be contacted uh, I have a, a CPA office in my constituency and I regularly contact them if I have a, a particular problem. I, I, I would, on this occasion, agree with the Cabinet Secretary that uh, people should be doing that. Uh, Claudia Beamish. Well, thank you, Convener. I'm, I'm uh, supportive of, of the uh, regulations. I would like to highlight what came up in previous discussion, which is 
about uh, the generality of, of the processes for community engagement right through a process and um, the feedback at the end of a process. And I think um, the conversations that were had earlier, I, I hope, will help with these. They are very important if we're to have a Scotland that really does involve our communities in, in uh, the processes that protect them. Okay. Other members got any questions to raise or points to make? No? Okay. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, do you want to wind up? Um, no, I think the conversations... Okay. I therefore put the question on the motion, which is that motion S5M12403, in the name of Rosanna Cunningham, be approved. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Thank you. I'm going to suspend briefly for a changeover of witnesses. Uh, good morning, welcome back uh, to this meeting of the Environment, Climate Change and the Land Reform Committee. The fifth item of business on our agenda today is to hear evidence on the community right to buy abandoned, neglected or detrimental land regulations 2018. We'll hear from the Cabinet Secretary, uh, Secretary Rosanna Cunningham and her officials, Dr Simon Cuthbert Kerr, who's the head of the Land Reform Unit, and Andrew Roxton from the Scottish Government's Legal Directorate. Um, Cabinet Secretary, I want to invite you to make an opening statement, which I understand will cover all of the um, relevant instruments before us today. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, the secondary legislation that we're discussing today will bring into force Part 3A of the Land Reform Scotland Act 2003. Um, the community right to buy abandoned, neglected or detrimental land. And that's land that is wholly or mainly abandoned or neglected, or the management or use of which is causing harm to the environmental well-being of the relevant community. I think it's really uh, important to emphasise that Part 3A is not intended to be the first step that a community should take when trying to buy land in order to deal with the problems that it might be causing. The Land Reform Scotland Act 2003 requires that they should have already tried to buy the land through some other means, and that where they're claiming that there is harm being caused to the environmental well-being of their community, they should have tried to fix that harm by going to relevant regulators, and that obviously relates to what we've been discussing before this, before applying for a right to buy. It's, however, a powerful and far-reaching right to buy, particularly as it introduces an element of compulsory purchase. It will add to the existing community right to buy, which has been operating successfully for over 15 years, and obviously we've had the uh, most recent uh, successful buyout, uh, um, community buyout of Ulva. These affirmative instruments cover the more substantive elements of this package of instruments. Um, they are largely concerned with the matters which ministers must have regard to when considering whether land is eligible to be purchased under this right to buy, 
as well as the prohibitions placed on the owner while an application is being considered. In considering whether or not land is eligible under Part 3A, ministers must have regard to matters set out in the regulations. As Part 3A is a right to buy which is compulsory, it is right that ministers have regard to a number of different matters when considering whether land is, in fact, wholly or mainly abandoned or neglected, or is causing harm to the environmental well-being of a relevant community. Regulations 3 to 5 set out matters that ministers must have regard to in relation to the physical condition, designation or classifications, and the use or management of the land. Regulation 6 sets out the matters that ministers must have regard to relating to environmental well-being. And this includes whether the land has caused a statutory nuisance or whether it has been subject to a closure order or notice under the Antisocial Behaviour Act. It looks at whether harm is being caused to environmental well-being. Now, I know that some stakeholders want environmental well-being to extend to social and economic matters, and this was debated during the passage of the Community Empowerment Scotland Act 2016, which is what inserts Part 3A into the 2003 Act. In assessing whether land is eligible for Part 3A, some social considerations can in fact be taken into account, but only where they result in harm to a community's environmental well-being. It's important that we don't try to stretch the meaning of environmental well-being too far, because if we stretch it too far, it will break and it will break in court. But I recognise the importance of these matters being taken into account, and I have instructed my officials to explore ways in which uh, this might be achieved. Part 3 is a compulsory purchase right, and we absolutely do not want that to interfere with individuals' homes. And that's why land which is someone's home is excluded under the Act. However, if that land is occupied under a tenancy, it is not automatically excluded. And this allows a community body to apply for land even where there is a tenant in place. Part 3A does not interfere with the tenant's rights under their tenancy, however, and the instrument takes account of protections offered to tenants by other legal arrangements. The first of the negative instruments sets out how any person, including an owner who incurs additional costs as a result of complying with the Act, can claim compensation under Section 97T of the 2003 Act. The second of the negative instruments covers a wider range of subjects relating to the process a community must follow when applying under Part 3A, including the ballot, advertising the fact of the application and what costs a community body can claim from Scottish ministers. I know the committee will have questions and I'm happy to answer them. Uh, thank you, Cabo. I think a, lot, a number of members do. But let me kick this off. You, you touched there about concerns that stakeholders have raised. Could you briefly talk us through the consultation process that took place around these and how stakeholders' views were taken into account in developing the regulations? Um, yeah, there was a public consultation uh, and all of the instruments that took place actually in 2016, immediately following um, the uh, uh, legislation, I presume, from March to June uh, of that year. A total of 51 responses were received um, and there was an analysis of the consultation responses published in September 2016. Um, during January 2018, that is this year, a, a series of face-to-face -face meetings with key stakeholders were held to discuss the draft regulations, and that included Scottish Land and Estates, Community Land Scotland, Community Ownership Support Services, NFUS, Cairngorms National Park, various uh, housing groups. Uh, additional engagement with stakeholders and community groups has also taken place. Okay, let's move this on then. Uh, John Scott. Um, <clears throat> thank you, uh, convener. Um, could I just um, ask you, uh, Cabinet Secretary, about the the Scottish Land and Estates uh, questions that they have raised in this regard, and there's no longer a need uh, for an owner to be informed of an intention, apparently, of a right to buy and the impact this may have on an owner's ability um, to defend his position, and also it could have further implications um, if they are not aware of this um, to carry out in good faith transactions, um, which this would limit uh, their ability to do so, and yet they might um, be falling foul of the law 
inadvertently be, uh, in carrying out transactions in good faith. Um, and, and, and why has that why has that been changed? Well, there were some changes made um, after discussion um, with stakeholders. Um, uh, there is uh, there are there are key changes, and I, I don't know if this is what the member is particularly asking about. There's a, a key change to uh, the restriction period um, and um, uh, a change in respect of uh, balloting information um, uh, as, as well. Um, uh, I don't know if the SGLD wants to just come in here on this, on this particular issue. Yeah, um, I think um, in relation to the point raised by Scottish Land and Estates, um, that was relating to the um, restriction period, which is um, set out in, in the draft affirmative regulations. And I, as I understand, the provisions relating to that particular provision were changed following discussion with stakeholders. Um, and so the restriction period now starts um, when an application appears on the register um, of applications by community bodies to buy land rather than when a person is notified. Um, and I understand that the, the reason for that was um, that following discussions with stakeholders, there was a, um, a, a small window where between um, Scottish ministers receiving an application and it being placed on the register, it would have been possible for a transaction to take place without the buyer or seller being aware that the right to buy application or prohibition was in place. And the change to the regulations closed that window. So it was essentially um, what happens at the moment under the, the right to buy is that the community body must write to the owner of the land as well as the Scottish ministers. So um, they will receive notice at the um, at about the same time. It's not that the Scottish ministers write out as, as they do currently. Um, but what the concern was, was that um, there would be, a, if, the, if the prohibition period had started when the person was notified, um, that could potentially, there was a very small window between the, that notification and um, the application going on to the register where it was unre potentially unreasonable for owners to be aware of the, um, the application process. So placing the, starting the prohibition period from the point at which the application goes on the register uh, I think is, is hopefully trying to be a bit fairer to owners because it's clear at that point that the that's when the prohibition period starts. So anything that happens before that is not affected by the prohibition, which is uh, I think slightly different to what was what the regulations had previously said. So th this tries to address that address that concern. Thank you. Um, I should also declare an interest in this regard as a landowner, but. Um, it doesn't appear, notwithstanding what you've said, that you've convinced Scottish land and the state of the reasonableness of your argument um, in that regard. So you're swapping one unreasonable position for perhaps an unreasonable position in your view for an unreasonable position in other people's view. I think I what's been done is to try and, and, and bring some clarity to this and to not have even a short space of time which might be no more than a day where folk are unaware or could argue that they were unaware of a situation having developed and you know the need for you know given that we are talking about people's property rights the need for absolute clar clarity uh, is important so we have um, attempted to ensure that what is introduced into this legislation is that absolute clarity. Um, you know, I, I, I suppose uh, one could argue that it's, it's never necessarily going to, be, to make everybody happy, um, uh, but what this does now is remove uh, any kind of hours of dubiety that, that may have emerged from the way it was originally drafted. 
Um, thank you. Um, and, and since we're in the business of making things absolutely clear, then will every community is now it's now incumbent on a community to make an owner aware of their intention to buy. Um, is that if they don't do that for whatever reason, good reason or none, um, does that render um, their application invalid? Yeah. Yes, I mean there are there are duties placed on people, and the duty that is placed on a com community body is to make that notification. Um, uh, I'm just looking for yeah. absolute confirmation of that, but the but the community body is now required to do that as well as Scottish ministers. So it, the the existing right to buy doesn't work like that, but but this does because we are talking uh, about that introduction of a compulsory right to buy element to it. So it's about absolute certainty uh, um, for, uh, for those who are in ownership of the land. Keeping in mind that we're talking about land that is neglected, abandoned, or in detrimental state. And for further clarity, what happens if in the interim a transaction takes place, that the owner carries out a transaction before He's aware of the community right to buy, but after the community had, and takes uh, kind of takes a transaction in good faith, well, the being unaware of the community right. To well, buy. but the the, the 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 point about the changes means that the restriction on the owner will now begin when the application appears on the register of applications, rather than when the person is notified. So that so the owners. So you, you see my point, not. No, I can see the point. I mean, uh, uh, what you're what you're saying is, an owner could between noon on Tuesday and nine a.m. on Wednesday, effect a quick sale to avoid. No, no, well, or in or in. Because you know, effectively, in that's faith, what we're talking you know, things about. Things happen, and and without but there being. Effectively, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about that really narrow window. And it is precisely the kind of thing that we're discussing here that we wanted to just bring some clarity in. So now the prohibition period starts the minute something appears on the uh, on the register. Now that but, that you but know that, is that would require a landowner or an owner to check the register for them to be informed of that position. Well, but the, because the, before before they receive the letter and notifying them of that position. And in the reality of the of Well, no, world. to be notified by the community body and by Scottish ministers. In due course, but, one, but well, after it has appeared on the register. So there may be, in, in the reality, uh, rather from noon on a Tuesday, it's more likely to be noon on a Wednesday or Thursday or Friday before the landowner or owner is <coughs> notified. Um, that was, it, that, on discussion with stakeholders, that was the concern about the pre-existing way things were drafted. That is what we have, that uncertainty is what we are now closing the door to by shifting the prohibition period forward slightly to make it on the registration. Um, uh, but, you know, I, uh, um, uh, and, and that is in direct response to the concerns that you're you're, you're expressing today. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, just very simply to summarise it, you can sell your, uh, and I'm a landowner beyond my household, um, you can sell your land up to the moment you get a notification from a community body of an intention to proceed. Uh, you can technically yeah. sell your land up until the point at which the, the, restriction, the, period the restriction period starts, which is when the entry appears on the register. But ministers and the community body are, are obliged to inform the landowner. Uh, so... Yeah, I, th I think in, in what happens uh, under the, the, the provisions at the moment is that when the community body applies to Scottish ministers, they must send a copy of that application to the landowner at, at the same time. The, the prohibition will not take place until Scottish ministers actually tell registers to place the application on the, on the register. So I think in practical terms... But a copy of that instruction yeah. goes to the owner as well. So when we instruct the 
application to go on to the register, the owners are, we, we send a copy to the owner as well. So the, the, the owner is being kept informed within this small space of time. Um, but for the, for the crystal clear nature of it, the prohibition period, the formal prohibition period starts when the application appears on the register. So, so Kevin, it's entry, there is additional communication with the owner of the land compared to what prevailed before? Yes. Okay. Okay, so, so we might have Mark Roscoe. Guidance on the interpretation of the regulations? Uh, when will yes, that come there, will out? Be, uh, there will be guidance, um, and uh, I expect that guidance to appear, um, uh, uh, be available to communities um, uh, shortly. Um, we've already engaged, obviously, directly with communities and other organisations, um, and we'll be continuing with that activity while, while the guidance is developed. Um, uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, a time scale, um, uh, I would be loath to commit officials to a timetable, but I'm looking at the senior official here, so he may be able to give us a bit more. Yeah, and we're, we're looking to bring guidance in as soon as possible um, following um, the regulations come into force, so late June, early July. Was there a reason why you couldn't provide draft guidance? you know, to, to inform our scrutiny of this? Because there, there does seem to be some issues around interpretation. And it may, it maybe would have helped if we'd had draft guidance Well, there's coming. been a very great deal of discussion about, about some of the drafting of this. So I think if we'd tried to produce guidance, it would have been premature guidance um, and wouldn't have been particularly helpful and probably would have had to have been revised in any case. Right. OK. OK. I if we've exhausted that particular point, John Scott's got a further point. <clears throat> the further issue that Scottish Land and Estates raised with regard to forestry, and it's um, in the letter to us, um, there is no reference to forestry plans, um, which in a rural context can be quite significant. And apparently, uh, for example, post felling, it could appear to be abandoned land. And should that be part of the regulation? Um. <clears throat> If land is deemed eligible, um, issues such as forestry plans, etc., et um, uh, are taken into account in the overall consideration of the application anyway, um, as part of the public interest test. Um, so the regulations set out matters ministers must have regard to, but that doesn't preclude other matters from being taken into account as long as they're relevant to the various statutory tests. So. Owners are asked to provide comments on the application, which gives them the opportunity to comment on any and all matters they consider relate to the specific situations raised in the letters. Um, and those comments are considered as part of Minister's decision-making process. So the kinds of issues that are being raised specifically here are things that I would expect to see an owner flag up uh, um, uh, as... as uh, um, as part of, their, as part of their, their, their provision of comments to the minister. Um, you, this is very much more a ministerial decision than some of the existing right to buy. I mean, the existing right to buy obviously is a ministerial decision, but this, this is much more of a subjective decision-making process for a minister. So all of that information uh, will be uh, gathered in and taken on board. But it will, however, be uh, very much the responsibility of the owner in those circumstances to make sure that they bring to the table all of the issues that they think are important in respect of the land. Well, I hear what you're saying. Um, I'm not sure if I'm filled with confidence when you tell me that it's more uh, a subjective process than it was before. Well, but... it, it, it is it's the, the community right to buy that, we, that is pre-existing you know, the, the, as long as communities go through the set process, fulfil all the various conditions, um, uh, unless there's a complicating factor like a late application, then, you know, the likelihood is that the strong likelihood is they're going to be, have their application agreed. This particular process, because of the nature of it, uh, means that a huge range of issues need to be taken into account. You can't, uh, you know, 
legislate for every single one of them because every single circumstance is going to be different. Every single application that comes before a minister will be different to the one that, uh, 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 that has come, come previously. Uh, and therefore, there is um, a wider degree of ministerial uh, decision-making power there than currently exists with the way the present right to buy is defined. And a, but a forestry plan would be a relevant consideration. Yeah, absolutely yeah. a relevant consideration. Right. So, the point yes. about that is that, that owners are effectively invited to put forward anything that they consider to be a relevant consideration in the knowledge that it will be looked at as part and parcel of the whole balance of decision making in that particular case. No, that's very helpful as an explanation. I'm grateful to you for that. Can I just ask you now about the, the ballot, um, the balloting process, um, and just why the, the, some of the, um, the transparency has apparently been um, taken out of that process and that it's um, uh, no longer is it, uh, uh, re, um, regarded as being appropriate to, to share ballot information um, with uh, those who have a vested interest in, in asking for that, in, as was suggested in the 2003 Act, would be reasonable? Um, well, the option to request ballot information uh, from a community body um, was removed because of legal concerns about data protection issues. Um, however, provision of information to Scottish ministers is already provided for in the 2003 Act. Um, as such, we believe that ministers will be able to request information where necessary. Rules of evidence would allow another party in an appeal to request such information if need be. I see. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Finlay Carson. Thank you, Convener. Um, has there been any engagement with com communities who wish to, wish, may wish to use these uh, provisions? And do you have any indication how many are coming up uh, or, or could come up in the, the, the coming months? Um, practical examples would be helpful. Uh, and I know that the Cabinet Secretary is aware of the, the issues with Dromore Harbour. Um, do you think these provisions are going to assist that community? and moving things forward, because at the moment they're, they're getting very little support from QLTR and, and other bodies within the Scottish Government to progress their application. Is this going to make it easier? Um, well, they're not currently taking forward an application in respect of this. These, these are regulations which have not been brought into force yet. Um, I've just indicated that it's going to be very hard to set down a, a, a concrete list of uh, of, of of rules that will apply right across the board uh, uh, beyond what's here, um, because in every individual case, there will be a lot of individual issues that will require uh, to be dealt with. Community, the community land team has been raising awareness of the regulations, and that includes engaging directly with communities. Um, and, you know, for example, most recently, there were workshops run at the Community Land Scotland Annual Conference, which was just a, a week or so ago, um, we know that there are a number of communities who are planning to use the new regulations, but we don't have an estimate of how many applications might be made. Uh, we don't know from where they will come, and therefore I, I think it would be a pointless exercise for me to start trying to hypothesise uh, uh, on, on any individual potential application that might exist uh, in, in, in the future. Um, whether the community involved in the, in the process that the member is raising uh, uh, chooses to have a look at these new rules, it will be a matter entirely for them. Um, but I need to remind uh, everybody that this is not a first resort set of rules. This, in a sense, is a kind of final resort set of rules. Okay. Okay, let's open this out. Uh, Joan McAlpine wants to come in. Thank you very much, convener. Many of the communities um, that you refer to um, will have uh, been very heartened by the definition of harm to environmental well-being laid out by um, the previous minister, uh, Aileen, Dr Aileen McLeod, during uh, stage three of the Community Empowerment Scotland Act 2015. Uh, and that's obviously raised in the uh, 
the briefing from Community Land Scotland uh, to the committee. Um, originally, uh, Dr McLeod said that uh, harm to environmental well-being, she wanted it to, the definition of environmental well-being to be a very broad one. Um, and she suggested cases where use or management of land would cause harm to the community, with examples such as boarded up shops and unoccupied housing. Uh, I have a community group in, in my constituency that's very interested in um, buying back its high street, um, and it will have uh, been inspired by um, the way that Dr McLeod laid out the definitions there. Now, um, Community Land Scotland are saying that the regulations that you've put forward are so tightly drafted in terms of it's got um, land has to be seen as being uh, subject to environmental protection notices uh, that they may not be able to go forward with their plans. And I wondered what uh, reassurances you could give to uh, organisations like that that we haven't backtracked on this legislation. Well, I can't go into uh, details of discussions that took place um, uh, three or four years ago, and I wasn't involved in them. So the detail of those uh, conversations um, and uh, how they've been construed are not uh, is something that is you know difficult for me to uh, refer to. However, I think it, I need to say that these regulations will allow communities to take action where the use or management of land is causing harm to the community's environmental well-being. It will, they will also allow some social considerations to be taken into account where they lead to that harm to environmental well-being. Um, the environmental well-being elements of the regulations will provide powerful opportunities for communities. However, in law, environmental well-being has a particular meaning and it is not possible to make it mean something beyond what it actually is. And I know that stakeholders are keen to ensure that a wider range of issues can be taken into account when determining the eligibility of land. Um, so rather than trying to fit these concepts into the definition or into a definition of environmental well-being and knowing that it is likely to be then subsequently rejected, it is better to explore, in our view, other options for how we might achieve those ends, because we do still want to achieve those ends. So th there are two potential ways to look at it. One option is to actually amend the 2003 Act so that specific issues can be taken into account. And I've asked my officials to look at ways in which that can be done effectively. Um, the other potential option is to look at um, Part 5 and the regulations that... Uh, will emanate from part five, which have to do with sustainable development. Um, so we're actively pursuing other ways to manage this. Um, but if we try to press ahead with the pre-existing uh, uh, idea that environmental well-being can be stretched as far as people currently want it to be stretched, it will come apart at the first test. And I don't think that would be helping anybody um, uh, because we would end up in a situation where the first challenges led to failures and that wouldn't be helpful. How can this committee have confidence that that will happen? Would we not be better waiting to see what your officials come back with once you've had the time to uh, consider how we can make this work? Well, I presumed that the committee would want to see these regulations uh, uh, brought into force as soon as possible while we explore uh, ways in which we can ensure uh, that what I know people want to see uh, uh, apply does apply. If, if these regulations don't come into force now, there will be nothing uh, for communities under this, uh, under this particular right to buy at all. And I'm assuming most communities, and as I understand it, Community Land Scotland, do want this to go ahead. Community Land Scotland did suggest some new drafting for the regulations in uh, the appendix to the briefing to the committee today, which, I, again, I'm sure you're aware of. Um, what was, was, was there a problem with the, the suggestions that they came up with in terms of their draft regulations? Um, I, th I think there's... There's 
these are issues that were also considered by government beforehand. I think that um, the, the two, the, the main issue is a, is a virus issue in terms of whether the concepts that are set out, um, whether the concepts that are set out there are actually things which relate to the environmental well-being of a community. Um, and I think that um, th there is also a, a sort of secondary concern about um, the, the width of some of the concepts and the fact that that might create an ECHR issue in terms of the foreseeability of, um, in order for owners of land to be able to uh, arrange their affairs in a way that doesn't mean that they um, fall foul of these regulations in terms of um, in terms of how they how they use their land. So I think I think the the, the main issue for some of the wider wider considerations such as economic or social well being um, is that it's it's stretching as the cabinet secretary said is, is stretching what what is able to be done under the the current primary legislation which relates only to uh, in, environmental harm, environmental well-being. Um, the, 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 the primary legislation does try to make, um, try to wi widen that because um, it does say um, that uh, harm to environmental well-being um, can include harm that has an adverse effect on the lives of the persons in the relevant community. So it tries to recognise that um, it's not strictly focused on environmental concerns of themselves. It's, it's the, the impact that those environmental concerns can have on the lives of the community. You know, encouraged yeah. by that in the primary legislation, but it's like these, have you tested these, um, you know, the, the regulations you've laid down here, for example, it's got to be subject to a closure notice, um, it's got to be subject to anti-social behaviour uh, notices or statutory nuisance notices. Have you explored how, you know, like the instances in which uh, those kind of regulations are laid down? And uh, I mean, my understanding is that they're, they're really quite tightly Drafted. I mean, an anti-social. How many anti-social behaviour notices are laid down? How many statutory nuisance notices? I just think about my own community, and there are constituents who come to me about land where any, you know, reasonable person would think it was a statutory nuisance, uh, but the local authority do not put down these notices. So, I, but can I remind members what I said in answer to an earlier question, which this is not a a, a process of first resort. This is meant to be a process when all other things have been exhausted. So you don't leap straight to this. You actually try to fix the harm or the harm, you, you, you know, there's an, there, are, there are attempts to fix the harm before you get to this process. And I think there's a tendency for people to, to perhaps presume that this is, this is our right to buy, which they can go to as a first resort it's not designed to be that, and the primary legislation says it's not designed to be a first resort choice. So, you know, I would be in the in the uh, in the role of a community body, looking very carefully um, and widely at what has and has not already been done in respect of uh, uh, particular properties, and what other processes and what other routes are already available. So this is not designed to be uh, a, a choice of first resort. And I think there's a danger that people become caught up in the notion that that's what it is. It's not. The members keen to come in on this specific point. Finlay Carson followed by Stuart Stevenson followed by Claudia Beamish. Thank you. It, it's just the back of, of uh, Joe McAlpine's example. Uh, we, we, had, we heard evidence previously this committee, and please excuse me, I can't just from, uh, tell you exactly what session that was. But uh, I asked the question about uh, high streets and uh, whether the, it would give community bodies the, the, the ability to buy uh, you know, flats above shops or whatever that had been abandoned and so on. And I got the, the feeling that this was exactly uh, something that this new legislation could do. It could allow communities to make a decision on the adverse effect those abandoned flats or whatever has on those, on those 
their lives. But it sounds like you're backing off that. That's, that's the case. I mean, it may very well do, but it would depend entirely on the circumstances and the specific issues that are around that particular piece of property. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I, I'm, you know, the antisocial behaviour orders, uh, I, I know that some properties end up being used for illicit purposes, etc. So these are the kinds of things that would all be uh, part and parcel of that. So I, I, th I think the point which I'm trying to get across is that uh, there's a presumption in a lot of the discussion around this that, that community bodies can go straight to this, but that's not how this is designed. And it never was intended to be a, a first resort. So that the, the, the hypothetical block of flats, um, uh, uh, there may very well be, um, uh, you know, some years worth of action and activity around that before a community gets to a point where this this becomes the appropriate way forward but but other means have to be exhausted other other means have to be tried and exhausted so you know there are and there are other right to buy options available as well that i would remind people of so it's not that this is the first one there's also you know the pre-existing right to buy in urban communities uh, which uh, uh, which can also be brought into play so this is adding something but it's not it's not the be-all and end-all and was never intended to, intended to be the be-all and end-all either. So, uh, you know, a, a, a hypothetical block of flats, you know, could have a whole set of issues around it which do make it applicable for this. Um, uh, uh, it, however, may have simply not enough issues or perhaps there's not enough, you know, activity have, ha has been entered into that would exhaust you know, before you get to this stage. That, that is the point about these regulations. Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. I'm, I'm looking here at the 1990 Environmental Protection Act, uh, Section 79. Afraid. <laughs> well, I've got it in front of me, Cabinet Secretary. Um, in particular, um, the definition of a statutory nuisance uh, which is in 1A, any premise in such a state as to be prejudicial to health or is a nuisance. Now, there is, of course, more to it than that, but, but, but it's a helpful starting point. And I, I, I just wonder, based on an experience I had in uh, an area which used to be my constituency before they changed the boundaries, uh, whether uh, we, we had a derelict building in a particular village on the high street that was accepted as being a nuisance by the local authority whose duty it is. The real difficulty was that the owners were hidden in Panama and it took 10 years to find the decision maker. Um, so I, I suspect, uh, based on my experience, there is enough power to which we're adding today um, to deal with the most egregious of cases, like the ones which I think are being talked about. Uh, but it isn't the issue really uh, with, uh, in particular, finding the owner, because often that is the key uh, to a resolution, in particular before we get to the point of invoking these laws anyway, because it's about communication. Uh, and ultimately that one was solved by communication, not by law, so to speak. Is that a fair comment to your cabinet secretary? Yeah, I think that probably is a fair comment. I, I, I suspect most of us have experience of some properties where, you know, whoever the owner was is very much lost in the mists of time. Um, and even tracking one to the Bahamas in some cases would have been, param well, whatever, but I mean, that, you know, would, would even that, you know, would be an advance on some experiences that we have had and and you know and that can be an issue but that is a, already an existing issue for for example local authorities who try to uh, progress compulsory purchase orders so you know the the, the 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 difficulty of establishing ownership is 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 an underlying uh, uh, problem for any of these processes and uh, you know and it's not one that we can fix overnight in, indeed, Cabinet Secretary, it may not be one we can fix in this Parliament. Uh, 
in well, relation to in, foreign? In relation to foreign registered owners, yeah. There's a number of people who want to come in. Can I, can I just kind of summarise where I think we're at? And you can correct me if I'm wrong from what you're saying. Um, notwithstanding the concerns that are being expressed, and I understand them having served in the last parliament with this bill in front of us, um, that if we don't pass these regs today, there will just be nothing that would allow any progress to be made. And if we um, do that, um, it could be quite some time before you, you worked through the concerns that are being expressed, that you've committed to working through before we had anything. So potentially we could have a number of potential problem uh, projects not being brought forward and, and taken to fruition. I, Is that what you're saying? It, well, yes, because if, if, if these regulations don't go through just now, then, then the, the, the right to buy won't be available for, for any of these reasons. Now, you know, we've had a fairly interesting discussion about where even with the existing, as currently drafted uh, regulations, there will be a number of different communities who will be in a position to be able to, to, to begin to act on this. And I would presume that most of them would like to be in that position um, uh, in, the, in the nearer future than would be the case if we halted everything to wait for uh, um, a solution to that bigger problem uh, to be developed, um, and you know that's that's just the reality. I, you know, I don't I don't suppose any of us want to be in the position that we're in. Um, ideally, I could make words or a phrase mean whatever I want them to mean. But this committee has experience of some of this kind of conversation in dealing with previous legislation, and the courts will apply the normally understood meaning of words and that's where we are um, and attempting to stretch the normally understood meaning of words beyond that is where you run into real difficulties so we have to find a different way to fix it okay. right, thank but you. we've had a good conversation about where in actual fact this might not be as restrictive as it as it looks at first glance well, I think others want to come in on this. Uh, Claudia Beamish, followed by John Scott. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Kavina, and uh, Cabinet Secretary. I'd like to build on that conversation because I still have concerns, having been um, uh, involved in the in the previous Parliament in in the um, in the Act and and taking evidence on it. And um, as Jo McAlpine's already highlighted, um, Dr. McLeod did make a commitment at stage three. Um, in which she said um, in the stage three debate, I reassure members that the definition of environmental well-being has a wide meaning and encompasses some social considerations. Now, I've listened very carefully to what you've said, and I understand that there can be legal challenges uh, to, to any law, but it would be helpful if you could um, clarify for us, um, is, is the first part of my, my um, brief line of question, I hope, um, what in law is the definition of harm uh, to environmental well-being that has, um, if, if I don't want to put words in your mouth, but which my understanding is, has, has made the Scottish Government decide to back away from the draft regulations that have been withdrawn, which were being under discussion? Um, well, I, I mean, part of this conversation that we've been having uh, highlights where some of the difficulties will lie the understanding that a court will construe the phrase environmental well-being in a particular way, not necessarily in the way that we would want them to, or as widely as we would want them to. Although, when you, when you actually look into this, some of the social considerations that uh, um, the previous minister was talking about are still absolutely applicable in, in respect of this, and we've talked about some of them uh, here uh, today. I mean, it, it currently will include um, antisocial behaviour orders. Now, you know, that's been imported into it, so it's beginning to look at a wider social uh, uh, consideration through that. And I think that the, uh, the very helpful intervention by Stuart Stevenson um, on the Environmental Protection Act uh, um, indicates another rather wider uh, definitional uh, uh, opening um, than perhaps people would be necessarily thinking of. So, uh, you know, what, what, uh, uh, what we're trying to do is all get to the right place. 
The issue is whether we can do it in precisely the way we first thought we could do it, and that is where the problem arises. So now we have to find a different way to achieve exactly the same end. So I, I understand what you're saying, and um, I, I agree with you. Effective legislation is really important, but that's the reason why I have concerns about um, the possibilities of... You've said that you, um, your officials are looking at 2003 Act and um, also Part 5 in relation to sustainable development. I mean, these, as we all know, are very complex issues. And I have concern about if, um, if those don't come up, those um, investigations don't come up with it, then this won't be the effective legislation that Dr McLeod and those of us who were involved in this process at that point um, were expecting. And if I can just highlight to you the the three aspects that, as I understand it, and please correct me if I'm wrong, have been um, withdrawn from the previous um, uh, drafting process. And, that's, and that is in um, Regulation 6, um, the extent, if any, to which the use or management of land has or is likely to have a detrimental effect on. And then the first one is the amenity and prospects of the relevant community, then the preservation of the relevant community or its development, and thirdly, the social development of the relevant community. Now, from my perspective as a lay person um, who went through the process of that bill in committee um, and spoke in those debates, I, I don't understand in what ways um, we're risking the courts by including those aspects in. And, and I really have a concern about it being passed today on that basis, because I agree with you, Cabinet Secretary, it is a last resort. But that doesn't mean to say that we must risk getting it wrong. Well, we're not going to get it wrong by doing what we've got done today. From the, perception of the, the perspective of those wider issues, the point we're making is that that will simply, you know, take us beyond any reasonable definition of environmental well-being and will fall apart in the court. Well, I, I'm, I, the member is shaking her head, but I'm sorry. My understanding that is a where, reality. Where it is a reality in which we have to live. If this ends up in a court, I court is that. not going to say environmental well-being is all of the things that we might want it to be. We can't. We can't. Even a parliament cannot override that. I'm not suggesting that, Cabinet Secretary. I'm, I'm still asking, what is the definition that's being used that prevents those clauses, those clauses being in, in it? And if, if they have been prevented, how can I, as a, in good faith as a member of this committee, vote for the passing of this motion today when I don't know whether the other two um, recommendations that your officials are working on, the other two possibilities, in good faith, I understand, are actually necessarily going to give us the answers that the communities need. Well, if you don't vote for it today, that will be a matter for the committee, but then there will be nothing I understand available. that. Not, not, and we've had, a, we've had a discussion today about what can and cannot be done under the regulations as currently drafted. If they don't go through today, none of that will be available to any community, and there will be lots of communities where the properties they're considering will fall within this set, this definition, this, this way of, of, uh, uh, of, of approaching it. And um, we do want to all get to the same place, but it, this is not the way in which we can do it. Um, and, you know, I cannot, I'm afraid, uh, um, uh, say to a parliament and then have a parliament perhaps vote on something which will have to be struck down because it is simply beyond the bounds of what is legally possible for us to be doing. You see, my concern is that it's not only Community Land Scotland. We had evidence when we were taking evidence on, on the bill, which is now an act, from um, Development uh, Trusts Association Scotland, Community Woodland Scotland, Com uh, Scottish Community Alliance, and indeed the Scottish Land Commission at that stage. And then Dr MacLeod gave that commitment. So I find myself in a difficult position today, and I need that um, recorded officially. It is, of course, the case that none of those other bodies have come back raising concerns about this they, instrument. They, they were all, um, just the for time, clarity, yes. no, no, I, I'm sorry if I wasn't clear, convener, but for clarity, my understanding is, but this is only from Community Land Scotland, um, that um, the draft um, provisions, which have now been removed, were also endorsed by those stakeholders. Mm. 
But I'm, I'm simply saying it puts me in a difficult position. Okay. Um, John Scott to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. There's certainly, um, thank you, there's certainly other, other parties other than Community Land Scotland who are voicing concerns about this Scottish land and the state's historic houses. But in terms of um, what Claudia Beamish has just said, it is perhaps worth noting that in the paragraph that she quoted from with regard to Dr Aileen MacLeod, she went on to say, following your quotes, that we were not able to consult fully on extending the right to buy beyond what I have proposed in the government amendments in the group. If Parliament were to widen the circumstances in which communities can acquire ownership of the land through compulsory purchase, we want to be clear about the evidence of the harm that the proposals would address and to consult on that to find a proportionate solution. I'm not sure that consultation has ever taken place. Has it? Well, I... I don't I'm believe sorry, so. I mean, I wasn't, I, I, the, the consultation that followed the passing of the legislation was, was set out in March 2016. Um, uh, and, you know, that's the consultation that took place. And I, I, I don't know who was... On that point of, of, of Well, it would have been well on the, the whole of the, of, of the regulations. I see. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, Stuart Stevenson, to be followed by Donald Carver. Uh, uh, thank, thank you very much, Convener. I'm, I'm looking at Regulation 6 uh, within uh, what's before us, and 6.1a, uh, whether the use or management of the land or any building or other structure on the land has resulted in or caused directly or indirectly a statutory nuisance. Um, and then it uh, at, paragraph, at subsection 2, statutory nuisance means statutory nuisance in the meaning of section 79.1 of the Environmental Protection Act 1990. And then I go to that and I, I, f I, I find that what we're doing is we're importing that quite long list of statutory nuisances, including in particular one, uh, which is nuisance becomes statutory nuisance under the 1990 Act. We're importing that in to give it the, us the leverage here uh, to be able uh, to empower communities to act, as I found in my constituency. They had, by a tortuous route, previously using the local authority and the existing Act, but without having directly a power. And is it not the case that by importing that statutory nuisance definition from the 1990 Act, we're now giving a direct power that that can be used in this way, whereas previously it, it simply enabled the local authority to take action against people when there were statutory nuisances. Now it's the community can take action when there's a statutory nuisance, including it being a nuisance, and that in particular being uh, issues uh, such as um, the amenity and prospects of the relevant community, a derelict building, the preservation of the community and its development. Social development, I, I'm, I'm not so, quite so clear, because I think the, the, the point that uh, Community Land Scotland uh, are saying environmental wellbeing is n not being defined in the bill as I want it to, to have a broad meaning. But, but I think to restrict it to the 2003 Act and not to look at the 1990 provisions which define statutory nuisance is perhaps uh, where um, th th there is a bit more to it than Community Land Scotland have been saying to us. Well, I think that's kind of partly come out of the conversation, that actually this does allow far more leeway than, uh, than the, the just looking at it in the very narrow sense. Yes, it does. Uh, um, uh, import into uh, the legislation direct reference to um, other pieces of legislation um, and interestingly enough that includes you know antisocial behaviour legislation so that it does bring into it I suspect quite a lot of the things that a lot of communities would want to be looking at anyway um, and it does that quite explicitly um, so so the 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 you know, in doing that, it opens up the potential for communities. But it, it, it will mean that communities do have to look very closely and carefully at, at building their case um, uh, and, and be able to show that it does actually fall into uh, one or other of these categories. But these categories do mean that the, 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 
the rationale for it goes quite wide in comparison to what people may at first glance have thought. Um, I've got uh, Mark Roscoe and Angus MacDonald want to come in on this point, and then we do move on, need to move on and explore other elements of this. Uh, Mark Roscoe. Convena, I think this emphasises the need for guidance again, uh, and you've given a commitment to the timescale for that guidance being brought forward. But can I ask for a couple of other commitments on timescales as well? You mentioned the two uh, reforms, the possible Amendment 2003 Act, uh, look again at Part 5 on sustainable development. When, when would these be uh, brought forward? And related to that, you know, none of us sitting here today can actually predict exactly how this regulation is going to pan out, whether it actually restricts communities who've got a very good case to be bringing forward a right to buy, or whether it actually provides an appropriate definition which will allow them to proceed through through court and, and you know with a robust legal case. Um, so again, it, it for me it, it it's an issue about monitoring this. So I'm interested to know how this is going to be monitored, and if it doesn't work, if it doesn't meet the original intentions that were set out by Eileen McLeod of the original legislation then what's the prospect to come back and look again at these definitions? Well, I've already committed to kind of looking at these other options. So that's a commitment that's already been made. Um, at the moment, the, the 2005, uh, sorry, the 2005, the part five uh, regulations at the moment are penciled in uh, to come forward uh, next year. Now, you know, if that becomes a suitable vehicle for doing something, um, uh, uh, I don't know you know, whether next year is a reasonable timescale if it's going to be, uh, um, if, if it's going to have to be looked at in this context as well. But that those regulations at the moment, as I understand it, are, are penciled in for next year. Um, in terms of the, you know, looking at the part three uh, route, it's very difficult for me to give you a timescale um, because it does involve, uh, you know, a very long, hard, serious look at all of this and then drafting regulations, um, uh, we, we would, I mean, the, in terms of monitoring th this, I mean, obviously the guidance on this is going to have to be very explicit along the lines of the, the issues and the other statutory uh, references that have been brought to play in this so that people do understand the variety of different things that they can consider when they're looking at the question of uh, uh, of this kind of right to buy. So the guidance will, will need to be, you know, able to be read by community bodies easily and clearly. Um, and we've committed to having that done over, by summer, yes. basically, by summer. So that will be uh, in uh, fairly soon. Um, in terms of monitoring impact and performance, you know, at a, at a basic level, don't forget that these things will land up on my desk. So I will begin to see, uh, uh, presumably fairly quickly, if people are beginning to use this or not, there will be then uh, uh, questions will be able to be asked, as are asked at the moment, about the numbers of right to buy over the last uh, however many years. And the, you know all of the, that information is then broken down by you know whether or not they were withdrawn late or whatever. So that will apply to this as well. So at that level, there will be uh, a constant ability to be able to establish uh, um, how often it's being used and presumably after a period of time, the success rate or otherwise. But we've also now got the Scottish Land Commission. So the Scottish Land Commission will be able to play a role in uh, monitoring impact and performance too. Um, and, you know, for example, I've asked the Scottish Land Commission specifically to look at the number of late applications in the normal community right to buy scenario because that worries me slightly that communities are leaving it quite late to put their right to buy applications in. And it's the kind of thing that if I saw, particularly if there were specific issues that began to arise through this, asking the Scottish Land Commission to continue to do uh, uh, or to do a piece of work um, uh, would be an option as well. So all of that would, I expect there to be almost like ongoing as we as we continue to monitor the, 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 the normal right to buy performance, we would continue to do so uh, on this as well. Um, uh, and, and, and that will begin almost when the first applications appear. 
So that, that process will start almost immediately. So would it be realistic then to expect some form of monitoring ahead of these part five redefinitions coming forward so we can see well, I, any I, definitions I'm, in the, well, if you just let me finish, any, any definition <laughs> changes in relation to sustainable development we can assess in relation to the early days of this regulation, assuming it's passed? This is an entirely demand-led process. I'm entirely in the hands of communities as to how quickly they begin to feed up applications. So if I get early applications, relatively early applications, then absolutely yes. If applications don't come forward for a while while communities think about whether or not this is the appropriate way forward or whether there's another route for them, then I can't, I can't say that. But I would expect there to have been at least some of these applications come forward um, uh, before we're in the process of actually doing the sustainable development regulations mm -hmm. next year. Isn't part of the issue here, though, about the applications that don't end up on your desk because communities are put off? And how do you actually monitor those? Well, in the same way that we currently do, which is that they, we always say to communities, when you first consider anything under right to buy, be in touch with the community land officials and they will immediately start to give you assistance, which is what they do at the moment. Communities are in touch with uh, um, the community land officials usually from a very early part of the process. And I would expect and hope that that would continue to be the case, that communities, when they start to think about this, should be in early conversation with community land officials. And in particular, the, 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 the one that a couple of members have referred to in Dumfries, to my knowledge, they haven't yet been in touch with officials. And I would strongly urge them to do so at the earliest possible opportunity, because often officials can can steer them in the right direction and, and that helps an application go through much more smoothly than it might do if a community picks up and goes off in the wrong direction too early. Uh, Angus MacDonald followed by John McAlpine. Okay, thanks, <coughs> thanks convener. Um, I, I think it's fair to say that uh, underpinning the, the key policy intention is, is clearly what, uh, what we all want to see, but following on from the, the monitoring point uh, that was raised, uh, if I could take that a bit further, uh, sp specifically uh, Community Land Scotland have called for a review of the effectiveness of the regulations uh, if they go through today uh, in meeting the policy intentions within three years of, uh, of their implementation and have also called for further commitment to make any necessary amendments to the regulation, uh, regulations and or the primary legislation to ensure that uh, the community right to buy is underpinning the original policy intention. Is there, uh, is there any uh, commitment to do that? Any intention to do that? Uh, I'm sorry, the, so the first one is about a three-year review? Yeah. Well, um, I would just remind everybody that three years from now we will have just had an election. So um, that, that, you know, th that's a kind of slightly problematic time scale. That's a call from community. Yeah, I understand that, but it, but it, but three years from now we will just have had an election. So, okay. um, it, you know, I, I, I would say that you know we would want to be keep, keeping these under continual review, um, uh, and that's how I would um, prefer to put it, so that people can see uh, on a continuous basis that they were uh, that they were working and perhaps working better than they thought or not. Um, because I wouldn't want to wait for three years before I kind of flagged up, for example, to the Land Commission and to officials if there were issues beginning to develop. So I, I, the, the danger of setting a time limit for a formal review in three years' time means effectively that between now and that review, you, you just let it chunter on. And I, I'm not sure that I want to be in that place because at the same time, we're also going to be developing these other regulations. So we'll need to just constantly be checking back on, on the way these work in practice for our consideration of uh, how, how else we can fix to widen it even further so that you know, th th those two things will be going side by side. Um, in terms of a timescale for developing those other regulations, well, I've indicated you know, that, that the, the sustainable development regulations are due next year. Um, if that is the route that's considered to be the appropriate route, 
Um, this might delay them by a couple of months, but it probably shouldn't delay them any longer than that. If, it, if it's a question of coming up with an entirely new uh, route, I wouldn't like to be tied to a time scale, but I certainly think um, it would be absolutely reasonable for me to say that this can be sorted in this parliament. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Joe McAlpine. Thanks very much. Um, Cabinet Secretary, you've been very clear that if we don't pass these regulations, then there's nothing, and um, that's why uh, I'll be supporting them, despite very serious concerns. Um, and I just wanted to return to your answers to myself and, and Stuart Stevenson, which were helpful, actually, in terms of you talked about the breadth of options open uh, to communities. But for, for many communities, you can be talking about empty buildings that they might not be used for criminal activities or illegal uh, parties or they may not be overrun by vermin they may be wind and water tight but they're lying empty and they're because of land banking and they're causing you know serious social harm to the community and the development of the community w will these regulations help in those cases well you know i hope we can develop a way of 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 putting something like that into legislation. That is what we're trying to do. Um, but, you know, we are, we have to be mindful of, of um, keeping the parliament within the law and ensuring that what we actually do is, is legally robust and is in compliance with ECHR, which everybody loves when it suits them but isn't so keen on when it begins to be a bit of a problem for them and you know that is the uh, the case here now i've been handed something to read and my eyesight is so poor i'm not sure i'm going to be able to read it without holding it out to here um so the length of time that the right so the the the, the use or management of land does include a consideration of the length of time that the land buildings and structures have, as the case may be, been used or managed as identified um, under previous paragraphs and not being used or managed for any discernible purpose. So the, the not being used or managed for any discernible purpose is already a specific phrase that can be can be looked at. So I think so I think I think what's coming forward is that perhaps the guidance needs to be very clear and run through perhaps without reference to other, well, we'd have to have reference to other considerations and other legislation, but make it very clear what it is that people can take into account and put it all in a simple, straightforward place that allows them to begin to think about whether or not that can, that can be a route forward. However, I go back to the thing I've said already twice, that there have to have been other attempts to fix the problem. So, so this, this is about a community uh, considering, you know, other other ways to do it. Can they directly approach the owner? Can they can they can they they have to exhaust other actions before they have resort to this? Which is another thing I think we would need to make crystal clear in the guidance that before you even get to that point, and it would be something officials would flag up if people would be in touch with officials. Well, what what have you done already? What what things have you already considered? And then officials will be in a position to be able to say, yeah, that. That, that is what we expect you to have done. Therefore, you are now in a position where proceeding with this community right to buy application is an appropriate thing to do. I'm conscious that we may have one or two other questions to ask. I suspect Stuart Stevenson wants to ask one about mineral rights. Uh, ye yes, indeed. Uh, as the self-appointed uh, committee geek, um, I... Every committee self-appointed geek. Uh, <laughs> In, 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 indeed, uh, Cabinet Secretary, um, I, I did raise on the 6th of March uh, issues around uh, mineral rights. I, th I think really all that I, I need to perhaps say is that the rewording that's resulted from that, which separates, as more clearly separates, um, the mineral rights from uh, other rights, because, of course, mineral rights are, in legal terms, themselves land, although they're not what we would commonly identify as being land. Um, I, th I think uh, I'm very content with the, uh, the new wording that we have before us, and uh, I thank the uh, Minister and her officials for uh, uh, responding to my geekish inquiry um, a, a couple of months ago. I don't think there's really anything I need to add to that. <laughs> um, can I ask members if anyone else has other questions relating to this instrument? 
No, we're content with that. Okay, um, where am I? Uh, so we now move to the debate on the motion at agenda item six, which is that um, motion S5M12209, that the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee recommends that the community right to buy abandoned, neglected or detrimental land, eligible land regulators and restrictions on transfers and dealing Scotland regulations 2018 be approved. Uh, Cameron Secretary, I invite you to speak to and move the motion. I would simply formally move the motion, convener. Thank you for that. Uh, can I invite any members to make comment? Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, as, as from the evidence I've heard, I, I don't feel able to vote for the passing of the motion today. Um, it has given me um, some reassurance about the two areas of work that are going to be taken on by the Scottish Government in the future in relation to 2003 Act and Part 5 on Sustainable Development. I appreciate these are very complex issues and, I, and I've listened very carefully to the arguments made by yourself, Cabinet Secretary, about um, the, the risks to communities of delaying. Um, this, this secondary legislation, but my view is that the legislation has to be um, clear and effective, and uh, I, I can't vote for it today because uh, my, my view is that um, I would be letting down a considerable number of stakeholders in relation to um, uh, the, um, regulation, the, the Regulation 6, and therefore I, I don't feel, especially as um, the... Um, the issue is uh, a very complex backstop. I don't feel that without hearing about the other arguments and where those are going and having some reassurance on, on those that I can vote for it, I'm afraid. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. I think it, it, it was very helpful to uh, uh, have the Cabinet Secretary confirm that this imported some existing provisions um, but created new powers for communities to use these provisions, not simply uh, it being confined as it previously was to local authority or, or uh, other uh, statutory uh, uh, officials uh, to do so. Uh, and in particular, um, having a, a understanding what statutory nuisance uh, would mean by importing it here uh, strikes me that uh, we've got the confidence that uh, communities have that backstop power and that we're adding very useful powers here. Uh, what I would encourage colleagues who uh, are uh, wrestling with some doubts on this, that uh, at this stage at least not to oppose, even if they are uh, wishing to withhold uh, support, uh, because I think uh, we, we seem in the discussion to have a shared view that this does take us forward. We only uh, differ to some modest extent uh, as to whether it is sufficiently far forward or whether it can only be seen in the context of subsequent legislation. Does anybody else wish to comment? Okay. Uh, from my perspective, sorry, John Scott. Well, I was just going to say that I think it's quite remarkable that this affirmative instrument has not satisfied those who are in favour of a right to buy, or indeed those who are against it. And I think I'm not certain about this instrument at all. I think it's possibly a work in progress, but uh, I'm still making up my mind as to whether or not I should support it because it's, it's incomplete, in, in my view. Uh, you, you say there's a matter of urgency, but this has been a matter of urgency since 2003. <clears throat> and therefore... Does Indeed, make the point that I am not aware of any of the stakeholders who want this legislation to be withdrawn or not go through today? From my perspective, I think, I think well, there is a consensus here is that we're not in an ideal situation. I think we would all agree that. But I think we would be letting down many, very many more stakeholders by not passing this um, than if we were to pass it. And, and given the commitments that you've made, Cabinet Secretary, around exploring other means of achieving the desired uh, outcome, with some concerns, I'm, I'm going to support it. Um, does anybody else wish to comment? Uh, 
point that you made there about the commitments that have been given. Perhaps back in June 2015, people felt that about Dr McLeod's assurances at that time. Indeed. Uh, Richard Lyle. Yeah, I think there are actually there are several uh, projects that people raised uh, in the last uh, wee while. And uh, if we don't pass this today, that totally stops them. So uh, they'll need to go back and explain why they voted against it. So I'll be supporting it because I think we have to move forward. Mark Roscoe. I, I mean, I, I sense a lot of disappointment that this doesn't meet the intention that Dr McLeod laid out several years ago. Um, uh, and I think that's a bit of a shared frustration all, all round. I think everybody in this room wants to see a very effective statutory instrument come in that gives the, you know, the strongest possible backstop powers to communities to bring in neglected and abandoned land and buildings back into use in their communities again. Um, I'm prepared to support this on balance, very much on balance. I've heard some commitment today. I've heard about penciling in of regulations and hopefully that can be inked in so you know we, we actually know that this is coming we can timetable it and as a committee we can actually go back look at the first year of operation see how it's how it's operating get evidence from stakeholders and hopefully look forward to a, a tightening up of the other aspects of, uh, of legislation that are needed to fully enact what was promised several years ago um, so on, on balance I'll, I'll back it as a as a as a small first step um, towards delivering what I think communities need in Scotland. But, you know, there's still obviously a lot more to go to, to build on that and to actually deliver what I think we would all recognise our communities need as an important power. Okay, thank you. Does any other member wish to comment? No? Cabinet Secretary, do you wish to wind up? No, I think I've said everything that needs to be said. Okay, so I put the question on the motion. The question is that motion S5M 12209, in the name of Rosanna Cunningham, be approved. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed, so we'll move to a vote. All those in favour, raise their hands. Okay. All those against? And can I know any abstentions? So by nine votes to two with no abstentions, um, the motion is passed. Um, I'm now going to suspend for five minutes uh, to allow the Cabinet Secretary to depart. Thank you for your time.
So the, uh, welcome back to this meeting of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. The fifth item on, uh, of business on our agenda today is to consider the following negative instruments. Uh, firstly, the community right to buy abandoned, neglected or detrimental land, Compensation Scotland Order, um, Order 2018, SSI 2018, forward slash 137, and community right to buy abandoned, neglected or detrimental land, applications, ballots and miscellaneous provisions, Scotland, regulations 2018, SSI 2018, forward slash 140. And I invite comments from members. No comments from members. Can I therefore take it as agreed that the committee has agreed that it is not does, does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to these instruments? Okay. That's okay. I think the same arguments and the same uncertainties obviously surround these instruments. Um, I'm sorry I'm cutting back across what you said, but um, I, st I still have particular concerns about them, I must say. However, we are where we are. So you, we are agreed unanimously as a committee with those concerns that you've expressed? Yeah. We are agreed. Okay, is that last? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, thank you for that. Uh, at its next meeting on the 5th of June, and subject to its report being published, the committee will take evidence from the Scottish Government's EU Environment and Climate Change Roundtable. The committee will consider a petition on drinking water supplies in Scotland. The committee will also consider subordinate legislation on the use of microbeads and the code of practice on litter and refuse. As agreed earlier, the committee will now move into private session, and I request that the public gallery be vacated as the public part of the meeting is now closed. Thank you.